Welcome to the 362nd episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with New York Times bestselling writer Lauren Willig, author of the new novel Band of Sisters. Stay tuned for the interview. And after the interview, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of Band of Sisters. The Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro FM. Libro.fm lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 185,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there, but you'll be part of a different story one that supports your local community and your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. You can listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Here's your special offer from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Get two audiobooks for the price of one today with your first month of membership with the code RWPODCAST at checkout. This offer is only valid for new members in Canada and the U.S., Check out Libro.fm today. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Lauren Willig, author of the new novel, Band of Sisters. Lauren is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of The Summer Country, the Rita Award-winning Pink Carnation series, and three novels co-written with Beatrice Williams and Karen White. Lauren, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me here. Great. Well, if someone hasn't heard about your new novel, Band of Sisters, yet, how would you describe the novel? I would tell them it is a story of forgotten American heroines based on the true story of the Smith College Relief Unit, a determined band of Smith alumni who charged off to France at the height of World War I to bring humanitarian aid to French villagers right behind the front lines. And do you remember the original impetus or idea that led you to write Band of Sisters? I do. I was researching another book. Um, You mentioned in your intro, I co-write, in addition to writing my own novels, I co-write with Beatrice Williams and Karen White. And we were writing a book set in three very calm and quiet periods of French history, World War I, World War II, and the 1960s. And for our World War I France section, we needed to know what Christmas would have been like under the German occupation, because you know, France was occupied during World War I as well as World War II. Uh, we just hear more about the World War II one. Um, and so I was desperately hunting for Christmas customs in Picardy during World War One, and up popped a memoir by a Smith alumna talking about throwing Christmas parties for French villagers in the winter of 1917. And I thought, this is insane. What on earth are a group of Smithies doing there 10 miles from the front line? This has to be fiction. I've stumbled on a novel. And so, of course, I did what any good procrastinating author does. I dropped everything and read the whole memoir. And it turned out that, in fact, this was not fiction. And this group of women were there. That's how I discovered the story. I knew immediately that it was one of those truth is stranger than fiction stories. I knew immediately that this had to become a book. And can you tell us a little bit more about this group of Smith alum? Sure. What happened was in April of 1917, a charismatic and highly eccentric Smith alumna, Harriet Boyd Hawes, um, became aware of the immense humanitarian crisis in France. Because what had happened was the Germans had occupied a slice of France in 1914. And when they got pushed back a little bit in 19. 
set in March of 1917, before they went, they herded all the villagers into one village and they destroyed everything that could be destroyed. They poisoned the wells, they broke the plows, they dynamited all of the dwellings, basically anything that could be ruined, they did ruin. They also sent all the able-bodied men and women off to work camps in Germany, leaving only the very young the very old and the infirm, um, thinking that, okay, they would then send these guys back to their ruined villages, like, hey, you can go home and leave them to be a burden on the French government and impede the French war effort. And Harriet Boyd Hawes, who was a pioneering archaeologist, but also a humanitarian and war nurse, heard about this and decided that something needed to be done. And clearly, the people who needed to do it were American college women. And she came home to the States and gave a rousing speech at the Smith College Club in April of 1917, where she said, basically, guys, we have this problem. And here's what we need to do to fix it. We need to go over there and we need to help rebuild these people's lives. Who's with me? And within three months, she had assembled a group of 18 Smithies um, and amassed an incredible amount in donations. They had, among other things, three trucks and um, houses that were you know, in pieces that they were going to put together when they got there. And they were on a boat to France and they arrived in August of um, 1917. And their, That's great. Their, their headquarters was at in a ruined chateau in a little village called Grey Court. And they were in charge originally of 11 villages in the surrounding neighborhood. But as their work became known, they, people kept asking them to take on more villages. And what they were doing were really um, sort of very unglamorous things. It was basic social service work. There were two doctors who were in the group. There were a bunch of women who were called the chauffeurs because they had some driving experience who were responsible to, for getting everyone to place to place in their little trucks, which were always breaking down. Down. And they were also trying to rebuild the agricultural base of the area. So these upper middle class urban women, many of whom had never encountered a chicken or a cow before, were out there buying chickens and milking cows. But basically, they were there to turn their hand to whatever they needed to do to restore the lives of the women and children who were there sleeping on mud planks, you know, without food, without milk, without medical care, without houses. And they were going to be rebuild their lives from the bottom up. That's great. Well, what was your research process for writing Band of Sisters? This was a research process like no other I've ever had. This is actually, this is my 21st book. And for the most part, I work heavily from monographs. I use primary sources where available, but often they're not terribly available. And I am triangulating around absences, trying to fill in the blanks. In this case, the amazing women of the Smith College Relief Unit wrote reams of letters home. And a very large quantity of those letters and their journals and pictures are stored in the um, Smith College Special Collections. And so the amazing super librarians of Smith College Special Collections digitized thousands of pages of their letters and other materials for me. And so I was able to read these firsthand on the spot accounts of what they were going through from multiple perspectives. So I'd often have multiple letters home talking about the same incident. So you can get different ideas of what really happened. And, you know, as opposed to most cases where I don't have enough material, I'm trying to guess here, I could tell you what they had for breakfast on any given Tuesday. It was really the, the sheer quantity of the um, footprint they left behind is amazing. That's great. Well, what led you to co-writing novels with Beatrice Williams and Karen White? Well, we had a very noble um, and uh, intellectual motive. We wanted to get our publisher to pay for our bar bill. This all happened. We were <laughs> Karen and Beatrice Williams and I are very good friends, and we were boozing it up at a conference one night. And we were moaning about the fact that when you go on book tour, you're by yourself. And there you are drinking alone in your room because you don't want to go to the hotel bar because someone might get the wrong idea. And you come <laughs> back all revved up after an event and you have no one to talk to. And then you have to get on a 4 a.m. plane the next morning to go to the next city all by yourself. And one of us, I don't remember which, had the bright idea of, hey, if we wrote a book together, they would have to tour us together and they would have to pay for our bar bill. And we just thought, well, we were pretty soused at the time, but we thought this was the most genius idea ever. And the crazy thing was when we sobered up, we still thought it was a genius idea. That's great. Well, you have a law degree from Harvard Law School. What was your writing journey that eventually led you to writing your first novel? 
Well, I always feel a bit of a um, a fraud when people ask me how I went from becoming a lawyer to becoming a writer, because for me, it was actually the other way around. I was that annoying kid who announced when I was six years old that I was going to write novels when I grew up. And I spent, you know, instead of going to tennis camp like normal kids, I went to UVA Young Writers Workshop summer camp um, training to be a novelist. And so after college, I decided in order to write absolutely accurate historical historical fiction, what I really needed to do was get a PhD in history. And so I toddled off to Harvard to get my PhD in history and thinking also that, you know, academics have these amazing three month long vacations. <laughs> it would be the best thing ever. I could be an academic for the academic year and then write novels in my summer vacations. And what I discovered while I was in grad school was, among other things, that you're really expected to use a lot of footnotes and you can't just make up things when you don't have the information, but also that academics work really, really hard. They don't get three month long summer vacations because they're working all the time. And on top of that, I really didn't particularly love teaching undergrads. So I moved a block away over to the law school since everyone in my family are lawyers. I figured, okay, time to succumb to the family curse. But while I was in grad school, I had written as a joke a swashbuckling novel about spies during the Napoleonic Wars. It was a complete spoof. It was a mashup of Georgia at Hire and Black Adder and the Scarlet Pimpernel and the romance novels of Julia Quinn and British Chicklet, which was really big at that time period. And I read a <laughs> lot of Wise in England working on my dissertation. And anyway, so it was this just big mashup of things that amused me personally. It was meant just to be privately circulated among friends. But a friend of mine gave the book to a friend of hers who was an agent. And a month before I was due to start at Harvard Law, I got a phone call from a man saying, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. And I would like to rep <laughs> represent you. And I was so shocked I spilled coffee all over myself. At first, I thought it was a hoax or a joke, but it turned out, no, he was a legitimate agent and he loved the book. And so next thing I knew, I had a two-book contract my first month at Harvard Law. At T-Mobile, we believe in putting people first by treating them right. So we're upping the benefits without upping the price. Introducing Magenta Max, now with unlimited premium data that can't slow down based on how much smartphone data you use. Plus, get Netflix on us. Right now, pay zero cost to switch. And bring your phone. We'll pay it off up to 650 bucks only at T-Mobile. Activate up to 4K or video streams at 480p, up to 40 gigs high-speed tethering. $650 via virtual prepaid card. Allow 15 days. Simmons support charges waived. Receive Netflix standard with two lines. So I did all upside down. I kept on... Since I had already started at Harvard, I figured I might as well keep going. And so I wound up writing three books while I was a law student, um, and then another book while I was an associate at a New York law firm. And then I just could not juggle it anymore and gave up <laughs> in 2008 to write full time. Wow. So, so given, your, given your success with writing, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Oh, goodness, where to begin? The first is to read and read broadly and mo mostly read things you like, because I think we are what we read and what you read sinks into your own writing in ways you can't even begin to imagine. I do also think that there I, I would generally advise against writing towards the market because the market changes. But I think if you are reading broadly, you are to a certain extent, imbibing the current writing zeitgeist, and you get a sense of what the trends are without even knowing that you know them, because you are involved in the same literary world everyone else is. I would also say, don't be hard too hard on yourself. Write for joy. Write because you want to tell this story, and not because you're thinking about how you're going to get it published. Because the literary world is a fickle, fickle place. You never know what's going to be popular one minute, what's going to take, and what's not. And you're going to be living with these characters for a very long time. And so every now and then I'll get emails from people who say, well, I've written two chapters of a book. Now should I start thinking about, you know, finding an agent or whether I should self-publish or go the traditional route? I'll be like, no, no, no. Do not think about publication right now. Think about your characters. Think about the work you're doing right for the love of it. And then when you have a finished draft, that's time enough to take a step back and start thinking about how you're going to position this and get this published. Because I think there are two brains. There is author brain and there's writer brain. And when you're working on that first book, you need to be in writer brain before you move into the professional side of it, which is author brain. Great. 
Well, are you working on another novel now? I am. Right now, I'm actually working on two novels. Um, I'm working on a prequel of sorts to Band of Sisters, because when I was working on Band of Sisters, I became really fascinated by the founder of the Smith College Relief Unit, Harriet Boyd Hawes, who was a remarkable character in her own right. And back in her youth, she had gone off after Smith to the American school in Athens because she wanted to excavate and was told that you know women don't do things like that. It's not ladylike. Yes, you can be a classicist, but you have to do the quiet parts of classics. Have you ever considered being a classical librarian? And she was like, no, I really, I need to dig things up. And she scandalized people by bicycling around Athens in her bloomers and that sort of thing. And so I was, but while she was there, the Greco-Turkish war broke out. And despite failing her Red Cross training test, she (laughs) went and um, volunteered as a nurse in the Greco-Turkish war and was decorated by the Queen of Greece for her bravery. And all all of that is very exciting. But then what really caught my attention was before going back to Greece, to pick up her amazing archaeological career. She became one of the first people to excavate Crete and made really groundbreaking discoveries. But before that, she goes back to the States where she nursed in the Spanish-American War. And I could not figure out why there was that blip. Why leave Greece? Why come back to the U.S.? Why nurse in the Spanish-American War? What brought her there? What drove her there? And although I'm not going to vouch for that with the real woman, for when I wrote Band of Sisters, I took fictionalized versions of the real people because I didn't want to put the real people's lives on public display. That didn't seem fair. There I was reading their private correspondence. I didn't want to betray their trust by putting their very private emotions into a very public novel. And so I created my own fictionalized versions. And so my fictionalized version of Harriet Boyd Hawes, who I named Betsy Hayes Rutherford, I have some ideas about what it was that drove her from Greece back to the United States and what made her plunge into the jungles of Cuba during the Spanish-American War. And that's the book I'm writing right now. (laughs) That sounds great. Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, goodness. I actually, you know, the pandemic has changed my reading habits, as I imagine it has many people's for a while, because I'm in New York. So we locked down hard and early. And for a while, all I could read, and you're going to laugh, were mid-century British mystery novels. I went (laughs) to my Agatha Christie and my Dorothy Sayers and my Josephine Tay, and a good friend recommended a rather obscure, at least obscure to me, British novelist named Patricia Wentworth, who wrote a immensely long series about a knitting spinster named Miss Silver, who is a private inquiry agent. Basically, she's like souped up Miss Marple. And those books got me through the first several months of the pandemic because they were such a comfortable world. It was that world of England between the wars where there's always tea at the vicarage and the squire at the big house on the hill and someone's you know burning wills or murdering someone for an inheritance. But you know that Miss Silver will always solve the crime and order will be restored <laughs> and everyone will be okay. And in the midst of all the chaos in our own lives, I found that immensely reassuring. Um, I've also been reading in addition to my my British mystery novel, Athon, a lot of women's fiction and chick lit. I just reread Louise Miller's The City the City Baker's Guide to Country Living about a Boston chef who takes a job in a small Vermont inn. It's basically like Gilmore Girls. And I think it's also like the mid-century British mystery novels. These are their own enclosed and safe worlds, these little sort of small American small towns or British villages. And it's wonderful to go live in that world for a while and know that everything there is going to be okay. That's great. Comfort reading. I totally understand it. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? Well, my official online presence is at www.laurenwillig.com, where I have a website that has steadily accreted bits and pieces over the last 20 years. So there, there's a lot of stuff on there. Um, I mostly interact on there through my news page, which is less a news page and more a blog by another name. Because back in the heyday of blogs, I, I was staunchly against having a blog, but there was stuff I wanted to say. So that was my compromise. I have a news page and I'm on there a fair bit. But I spend most 
most of my time procrastinating on my Facebook author page, which is simply Facebook slash Lauren Willig. Um, I spend a lot of time chatting with readers over there and posting random things that strike my fancy. And also on Instagram, where I am at Lauren Willig, where you can see both stuff about the books and all of the baked goods that my small children have been demanding during lockdown. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Lauren Willig, author of the new novel, Band of Sisters. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Lauren, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. This was such fun chatting with you. Great. Thank you. And now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of Band of Sisters by Lauren Willig, narrated by Julia Whalen, published by Harper Audio and available wherever audiobooks are sold. Dear Ma and Dad, I know this may come as some surprise, but I've decided to leave my position at Miss Cleary's to join the Smith College expedition to France. Dear Ma and Dad, I hope the boys are well. I have some exciting news to share. I've signed up with the Smith College Relief Unit. We're a group of alumni who mean to sail for France to bring aid to French villagers. I've resigned my position at... (sighs) Dear Ma and Dad, you may have read in the news about the Smith College Relief Unit. Ugh. Dear Ma, would it be all right if I joined you all for dinner next Sunday? I'll be in town and would very much like to see everyone. Your loving daughter, Katie. Miss Catherine Moran, class of 1911, to her mother, Mrs. Frances Shaughnessy. July, 1917. New York. It was a very long way down to the wharf from the deck of the SS Rochambeau. Kate hadn't expected the boat to be quite so large. When Mrs. Rutherford had informed them that a packet boat would be carrying the Smith unit across the Atlantic to France, she had pictured a cross between the Staten Island Ferry and one of the barges that chugged along the East River, something squat and rectangular and human-sized. Not this behemoth of a ship, taller than a townhouse, giant smokestacks punctuating the sky, crowded with war workers of all description— American ambulance men exchanged war stories with French aviators. Journalists jostled aid workers. Kate felt smaller than small in the midst of it, among all these laughing, shouting groups, families hugging, mothers kissing their sons one last time, champagne corks, of all things, popping, baskets of fruits and bouquets of flowers piled into the arms of overworked porters, already staggering under piles of trunks and bandboxes and goodness only knows what else. It felt more like Smith graduation than an embarkation. Well, she hadn't really expected them to come, had she? Her mother had made her disapproval clear. Have you run mad was a phrase that didn't leave itself open to much misinterpretation. There were lifeboats all around, swung out in the ready position in case of need. On the walls, strongly worded notices forbade such dangerous activities as smoking after blackout once they reached the war zone. Blackout. War zone. Maybe her mother was right. Maybe she had run mad. Blame the day. That July day that had been hotter than hot, her room in the boarding house sweltering, the stupider-than-usual student who had come to her for tutoring in French, the sweat dripping down the back of her neck making her itchy and irritable. At that moment, any place in the world had seemed preferable to where she was, to that horrible, stultifying room that stank of cabbage, the brainless debutantes she had elected to teach in what had been meant to be a temporary position, but it becomes six years of mindless drudgery. Kate hadn't cared terribly much about the cause itself, but the idea that someone would pay her way, there were funds, Emmy assured her, it wouldn't be charity, nothing like charity. To go abroad had seemed too good a chance to miss. We need you, Kate, Emmy had pleaded, and she'd allowed herself to be persuaded, less from charity than from desperation, Desperation to be anywhere other than where she was.
With Metro by T-Mobile, your hard-earned money goes further. This tax season, there's zero fees to switch. Enjoy Metro's lowest price. Just 25 bucks a line for four lines. Plus, get four free Samsung Galaxy phones when you switch. Now that's the best deal in wireless. Metro by T-Mobile, empowering you to rule your day. All lines lose promo rate if any deactivates. No fees on select phones. Limit one per line with eligible port. Exclude sales tax. Limited time offer. Additional terms apply. See Metro by T-Mobile.com. Good afternoon. Would you like to try a free sample of our double fudge brownie? Oh, sure. Mmm, that's very good. I- I'll just take one more, just to be sure. Yep, still very good. Some things never change, like never being able to take just one free sample. And Geico saving folks lots of money on their car insurance. Mmm, it- is that macadamia nut I taste? Let me take one more. Sir, mmm. I thought so. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.